Good morning, and thank you for your patience. Pardon my delay, I was caught up in another meeting. Um, I am Julissa Ferreras, Finance Chair, Committee, Ooh, committee, meeting, uh, committee Chair. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge the members of our committee who have joined us, Council Members Johnson, Levine, Cornegie, and Minority Leader Matteo. I would also like to welcome back the Finance Council, Rebecca Chasen from her maternity leave. Um, welcome back. Today, the committee will be hearing two bills. The first, a pre-considered introduction introducing, introduced by request of the mayor concerns the levying of a surcharge on wireless communication services. Since 2002, the city has imposed a monthly 30 cent surcharge on wireless communication services, providing revenue that goes to support the operations of public safety communications networks serving the city. This year's state budget included a new provision that requires the council to enact new legislation to extend the current surcharge, as well as the levy on a new 30 cent surcharge on, a prepaid wire, on any prepaid wireless communication service. The state, not the city, would now administer the surcharge, but the city will continue to use these funds for public safety communications purposes. Finally, I would note that OMB assumed uh, the continuation of the current surcharge in Fiscal's 18 adopted budget fiscal plan. If the city elects not to adopt the new legislation, Council Finance eliminates, uh, estimates that there will be a shortfall of 11.1 .1 million in Fiscal 2018's budget. The second bill on the committee will consider this morning is a pre-considered introduction sponsored by Council Member Deutsch that would increase the maximum qualifying income for the senior citizens homeowners exemption and the disabled homeowners exemption, otherwise known as she and D. And okay. <laughs> Both uh, she and D are property tax exemptions that operate by exempting a percentage of a property's assessed value from taxation. Currently, seniors and people with disabilities are, are eligible to receive the tax exemption if the combined income of all property owners is less than 37 thousand a year. The threshold has not been increased since it was set in 2006, even as property taxes and inflation have continued to rise. Pursuant to a state bill signed into law at the end of July, the city is now authorized to pass a local law to increase the income eligibility threshold to 58,000, thereby providing benefits to thousands more, thousand more seniors and people with disability. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Michael Hy Hyman, um, first Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Finance, and Zhao Kumar, Senior Legal Advisor for Tax Policy and Planning after my counsel swears you both in. Good morning. Oh. I just need to swear you in. So I'm going to give the uh, oh, test, I just, testimony. I just need to, I, I'm sorry. We, we, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. So um, I'm going to do the testimony on the Shahid he income ceiling increase, and Zal Kumar will do the wireless surcharge. Good morning, Chair Ferreris Copeland and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Michael Hyman, First Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Finance. With me today is Samara Karasik, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs, and Zal Kumar, the Director of Business Tax Services at the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance supports pre-considered intro 6474 legislation that will allow the city to increase the income eligibility ceiling from 37,399 to 58,399 for the senior citizen and disabled homeowner exemption programs, which were recently rebranded as the New York City Tax Break for Homeowners. The City of New York offers property tax relief through our property tax exemption programs. Many low-income seniors and others lived on a, living on a fixed income have difficulty living in New York because of the high cost of housing, including property taxes. These property tax exemptions help people stay in their homes. 
Currently, Shahi and Dahi provide a property tax exemption of 50% of DOF's Department of Finance's assessed value for senior and disabled homeowners earning $29,000 per year, while homeowners making up to $37,399 receive, receive a smaller percentage exemption on a sliding scale. Under this legislation, senior and disabled homeowners making up to $50,000 would be eligible for the 50% exemption, while homeowners making up to $58,399 receive receiving a smaller exemption on a sliding scale. DOF estimates that 35,000 homeowners will benefit from the higher income ceiling. Approximately 26,000 homeowners will qualify for Shahi for the first time, and an additional 6,200 will receive enhanced benefits. We estimate that 2,500 households qualify for Dahi for the first time, and an additional 500 will receive enhanced benefits. The overall average benefit produced by this legislation will be $1,750 per year, per, per property, sorry, it's annual. The chart below details a new sliding scale for Shahi Dahi exemptions. I'm not gonna go through the details. The chart, basically, each bracket is increasing by $21,000. So the $29,000 goes up to 50,000, then the sliding scale is up by 21,000. Thanks to City Council support this past year, DOF conducted a Shahi Dahi renewal process for the first time in more than a decade. While we have processed all renewal applications that were received on time, we are still receiving applications and processing them as they come in. DOF sent out approximately 57,000 renewal applications, 52,000 for Shahi and 5,000 for Dahi last fall. Many homeowners completed the renewal process but lost their exemption due to the income ineligibility or saw a decrease in their exemption amount due to income. This legislation will allow the city to grant the exemption to 4,000 homeowners who were denied the benefit because of their income. DOF is planning an aggressive outreach strategy to ensure that all who are eligible apply for the exemption. We will offer in-person assistance at our business centers in all five boroughs. We understand that there are times when applicants need to communicate information about their financial and living situations that require direct contact with DOF. We will also partner with our sister agencies, the mayor's office, elected officials, community groups, and advocates to ensure that the city is reaching out to all stakeholders who work with seniors and people with disabilities to raise awareness of the exemption. We plan to use every tool at our disposal to publicize the enhanced tax break for homeowner program and to use this change to advertise the program overall. As always, we look forward to working with city council members to organize local outreach events and hope to hear from members soon to start planning. The city supports the legislation and is committed to ensuring that seniors and people with disabilities who live on limited means are able to remain in their homes. Now, Zal Kumar will give testimony on the wireless surcharge bill. Good morning, Chair Ferris Copeland and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Zal Kumar, Director of Business Tax Services for the New York City Department of Finance, and with me today, as you know, is Samara Karasik, our Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs. The Department of Finance supports pre-considered pre intro 6461, legislation that will allow the City of New York to impose a surcharge on the retail sale of prepaid wireless services and continue the surcharge on wireless communication services. The City of New York imposes surcharges on landline, voice over internet protocol, and wireless communication services to support the enhanced 911 emergency telephone system, also known as E911. The existing wireless communication surcharge, which appears as a 30 cent fee on New Yorkers' monthly cell phone bills, generates approximately 20 million for New York City's E911 system each year. The New York State fiscal year 2018 enacted budget adopted in April 2017 stipulates that prepaid wireless communication services can now be subject to a 30 cent per sale surcharge as well. We support this change and expect that it will generate 200,000 annually for the city's E911 system. The fiscal year 2018 enacted budget also shifts administration of the wireless communication surcharge from the city to the state. As a result, we will receive the proceeds via wire transfers into the city's central treasury. This change was adopted as an efficiency measure as the state collects the surcharge for all counties through New York, throughout New York State that are outside the city.
As part of the change, the existing authorization for the wireless communication surcharge was given a repeal date of December 1st, 2017. The city must now adopt a local law to authorize the surcharges and thereby maintain the existing wireless communication surcharge and ensure a seamless transition for wireless customers. The city of New York supports this bill to treat prepaid and other wireless communication services consistently, ensure continuity with the existing surcharge, and continue to raise much needed revenue for the city's E911 system. I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions on the surcharge bill and then we'll go to she and D. Um, the, uh, approximately how many New Yorkers would be impacted by this new charge on a monthly basis, do you assume? We don't have that data at this time. We pulled our estimate from the state financial plan and that's something we will follow up on after the hearing. Okay, so can you get that to the committee when you um, are able to get that information? Can, well, I think we both got lower. Um, can you get me that information once you have it in the yes, agency absolutely. for the committee? Um, and on average, how many times per year do prepaid wireless customers purchase the service? Do you have that data yet? Again, we'll have to follow up with you. After okay. And what do you estimate will be the average yearly cost of the new uh, surcharge for prepaid customers? Great. And do you know... Um, this came up actually amongst council members, and I just wanted to see if we can get this on the on the record. Um, when we talk about um, international prepaid cards, like a lot of families, especially in immigrant homes, um, purchase the card because it's cheaper than having a plan. Um, would this surcharge also apply to those cards that sometimes are, you know, two dollars, and it gives you a certain amount of minutes to be able to call internationally? It would apply to all prepaid wireless communication services, whether it's for international or for domestic. Okay. So if we could just get clarity on that actual Sorry. card as opposed to minutes that you're adding to a phone. This is minutes okay. that you would use to call from a phone, a random phone. So it's not exactly cell phone use. It's right. phone use. Well, if it's not cell phone use, it wouldn't end up in the surcharge. I just want you to confirm okay. that for me. Okay, thank you. Um, and by law, um, uh, the money collected from the wireless surcharge may only be used for public safety, as you mentioned, communications, as you mentioned in your testimony. Can you provide the committee with a detailed breakdown of how these um, funds are spent or how they've been spent? If you don't have that now, if you can provide that for the committee um, so that we can follow since we've had this surcharge added to um, the phone bills, this is where it's gone and how it's been used. So um, I'm going to wrap up my questions on this portion. Uh, I, I first want to, you guys did an amazing job, as you know, with screen. I feel like last year was all screen injury the last couple of years, and now we're on to um, helping improve uh, she and D. Um, and we say D, he, D, that's the problem. One thing you did with Scree and Dre was rebrand it, and it's called the rent freeze. Can we think about an opportunity doing something similar to Shahi and to Dihi or D or she or whatever you want? We to have rebranded it. I'm so oh, glad you well, asked. Oh, well, it's awful then because I don't know it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we're just, we, we, need, we need to start developing more new materials around it, but we have a logo. It's up on our website. It's called the New York City Tax Break for Homeowners. And for the record, this is Samara Karasik, Assistant yes. Commissioner of External Affairs. Okay, so it's called the New York City Tax Break for Homeowners. And like the REM Freeze program, we have like a little round logo. It's got a picture of a house in it. I'll send you guys the link. So will everything, like our veterans' taxes, will everything be under that umbrella? Or is it just for? It'll be for personal homeowners exemptions. So that's going to be Shahi, Dihi, veterans, yes. Everything. Yes. Oh, that's much better um, than trying to explain to a senior that they apply for she. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, if the income eligibility threshold were increased to 58,400, 50, 58, how many more households do you estimate would be eligible for the exemption? Well, if they say in my testimony, it'll be 35,000 new households in total. Um, 
mostly it'll be the 50%, 26,000, that's Shihi. Mm -hmm. 26,000 Shihi uh, will get the full, be new to the program, and 61, 64 will receive the enhanced benefit. So there are people who are in the sliding scale who now will probably go to 50%. And in addition, on Dehi, we have um, 3,031 additional beneficiaries. So the total is 35,000. As I said, the average benefit for the full population is $1,750. $1,750. Okay. And how many households do you uh, send renewal notices? Because I know that we, you just started this process. We had a little bit of hiccups um, with families that may not have known that they needed to renew, so on and so forth. How many um, households did you send renewal notices to, and how many have you re have responded? Well, we sent notices to 57,000 households. The response rate, I believe, was 40,000. Yeah, 40,000 have responded. Um, you know, we have, so that means that, well, 16,000 did not respond, but we've sent them three notices. We sent them a notice actually after the final roll as another opportunity. But I have to say, when we look at matches against, so we've done third-party data matches like with personal income tax and death files, we believe a good portion of them are no longer eligible for the program. Okay. So this will bring in a new group of population with the higher income ceiling. And we are about to do a mailing to what, you know, we did projections using personal income data who may be eligible. We're actually going to mail to each of those households saying we think, we believe you may be eligible and encourage people to apply as soon and, as possible. And how many of those that uh, did respond, how many of them qualified? I think that to, to give you the people who didn't qualify it was 7,000. So that by... Subtraction would be 33,000. So we're saying 7,000 were denied, and of the 7,000, 4,000 were denied because of income and will now be eligible. So we're going to automatically give the benefit to the 4,000 that are in this income range that we're now increasing. So they're going to get a letter from you saying you now qualify. Right. So That's a nice letter from you. Um, great. And then the 3,000 that did not qualify. Right, 3,000 that did not qualify, was it just based on income or is it like incomplete information or? It could be various things. I mean, it could be age, it could be, um, you know, prim primary residency. It could be a combination of factors, income could be one, but the 4,000 are the ones where the income will solve the problem for them. Okay. And looking at the pool of the people who have not responded, um, I know that you said a portion of them because you've kind of crossed check them. Are, do you think that there is a population that might just not know or understand, or what, what do you think that population is that we, that we as council members need to do, maybe can help you with? Well, I think we think that the majority of them don't qualify. And okay. some, sometimes it's a situation, you know, unfortunately we did go, I think if we've testified in other hearings, that we did go through a period where we didn't do the renewals. So we're finding that often there's like property ownership changes and the people who got the exemption are no longer the owners. Uh, for the subset where we don't, we're looking a little, I would say three quarters of the population fall into the bucket of either the, the person receiving the benefit is deceased or there's been a property ownership change or the income is higher than even the 57,400. Okay. So the rest of the population we're looking more closely, but the bulk of them we don't believe are eligible. Okay. Um, and what, just, you know, because people actually do watch these hearings, um, at maybe at 2 in the morning, but they watch them. Um, can you just say what the process is if someone is watching and they would be interested in, in seeing, oh, I qualify now because of the new piece of legislation, where should they go and what should they do? Sure. Um, so once the legislation, hopefully it will pass, and then the mayor will sign it. So once it is signed into law, we will have a special standalone application for this because people that apply and qualify for the enhanced benefit this fiscal year will get the benefit this fiscal year back to July 1st of 2017. So the first thing I'd say is it's really important that people submit this special standalone application because if they submit the regular application, they won't get it until the next fiscal year if they qualify. We will have that available as soon as the bill goes into effect. Um, people can get it by calling 311. But the other thing I would say is for anybody that 
didn't renew and believes they qualify under the new income range, we are still accepting renewal applications. So if somebody's household income is $50,000 and they didn't renew because they thought that they weren't going to qualify, they should still submit their renewal and we will process that renewal. At some point we're going to stop, but like today, right now, if somebody is watching this and they want to submit their renewal application and they think they qualify, we encourage them to do so. Okay. When we were um, discussing the veterans tax exemption, one of the things that we had mentioned was the opportunity when people are at closings um, to kind of have almost like a checklist of things um, that they can qualify for. Um, I would think, and, and I know that we were, su we're supposed to be following up on that and just looking at what opportunities, because um, I know you're either writing a check for your agency, right, to pay your the taxes or whatever the differences are, um, but it just seemed like an opportunity to let people know about their tax exemptions, um, and I would think that this is another one that we should probably add to that checklist. Um, no, I agree, and in fact, we're working on a program. One of our concerns for giving people information for things like tax exemption programs, but also to make sure we have correct contact information, since at the closing, often as title companies or clerks who are filling out the forms, we're trying to develop a program that we do outreach to the new owners to A, provide welcome to New York City information, which could be tax exemption programs, but also to verify and have them update any contact information so that we make sure they don't miss any communication from us. So part of it will be to inform them of programs and how they apply for it and all the eligibility criteria. I love that. I think that that's the right thing to do, um, a, a, a nice welcome to New York package um, full of information. We have additional questions, but I'm just going to, I know that, you know, we're running really late and I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Um, and we have others that want to testify. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we're going to be sending you additional questions. If you can get them back to me, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify today. Thank you. And we're going to call up the next panel. The next panel will be Belinda Liu and Olivia Meyer. If there's anyone else here that wants to testify, please be sure to fill out a slip with the sergeant at arms. So right now, this is our last panel. So if you want to testify, please be sure to fill out your slip with the sergeant at arms. Oh, and we were joined by Council Member Gibson and Council Member Rodriguez. Good morning. Good morning and thank you to Chair Ferreras Copeland and committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Olivia Meyer and I'm here to offer testimony in favor of pre-considered introduction 6474 on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-supported grassroots policy initiative and empowerment organization serving veterans, service members, and their families across the New York City metropolitan area. Affordable housing is a top priority for our membership, and like other New Yorkers, veterans and their families are struggling to find affordable housing as young veterans returning to New York City to use their GI Bill educational benefits while attending one of our world-class colleges and universities, or as retired veterans live on fixed incomes, many of them suffering from wounds and illnesses directly connected to their service to our nation. We've heard from veterans and families about the discrimination they faced from landlords based on their real or perceived disability status, or because of their service as a member of the Guard or Reserve. <coughs> and we are proud that the Council announced, addressed that discrimination with the unanimous passage of Intro 1259 last June. We further urge this Council to make changes wherever permissible to keep veterans and families in their homes whether it be through the tax exemption for veteran homeowners, also adopted by the Council this year, or now the important raising of the eligible income threshold for disabled and senior citizen homeowners, qualifying for property tax exemption under this pre-considered introduction. It is vital that the city's administrative code keep up with the rising cost of living for our most vulnerable New Yorkers and to provide tax relief wherever possible so we can keep those who have worked and struggled and given of themselves to make our great city great are able to remain stable in their homes. Raising this threshold will qualify many aging and disabled veterans and their families for needed tax relief, easing their financial burden and making it more possible for them to remain stable in their homes and in the city they've served and sacrificed for. We urge this committee to adopt this needed change and to continue their work making housing more affordable for all who work to make the city great. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, Chairman uh, Ferraris Copeland and members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Belinda Liu. I'm a staff attorney at uh, uh, Mobilization for Justice, formerly MFY Legal Services. I'm a staff attorney in the Foreclosure Prevention Project. Um, as an organization dedicated to preserving New York communities, uh, Mobilization for Justice commends the Council for examining the city's effort, efforts to increase protections for senior citizen and disabled homeowners. Uh, Mobilization for Justice strongly supports the Council's proposal to increase the eligible income threshold for both the senior citizen homeowner exemption and the disabled homeowner exemption. The proposed increases will preserve home ownership for a greater number of New York's senior citizens and persons with disabilities and, as a result, stabilize and preserve the communities where they live. Today I would like to highlight the recent experience of one of our senior citizen clients, Mrs. J, to demonstrate uh, the need for the Council's proposed changes. Mrs. J has owned her home in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn for over 30 years. Um, unfortunately, when her husband lost his job a few years ago, Mrs. J fell behind on her mortgage payments. Uh, Mobilization for Justice currently represents Mrs. J in a foreclosure action that was filed against her. A recent widow and disabled, Mrs. J relies on rental income from two units in her property and her social security benefits to manage her living expenses. Altogether, her gross annual income currently is about $43,000. Given the rapid gentrification in Bedford-Stuyvesant, the market value of Mrs. J's home, which she shares with two of her grandchildren in addition to her tenants, has skyrocketed in recent years. This would be a fortunate development if uh, Mrs. J was interested in selling her home. Um, however, this is not the case. Um, in fact, Mrs. J sought her assistance specifically because she is determined to keep her home of over 30 years as a stable residence for her and her family. However, the increasing property valuation has caused her property tax obligations to increase as well. Meanwhile, Mrs. J's already fixed income recently de decreased dramatically when her husband passed away, making it increasingly burdensome for her to keep up with her property taxes. Under the current version of Section 11.245.3, uh, Mrs. J does not qualify for the exemption. Under the proposed amendments, however, um, she would qualify for a 45% exemption. This would result in a lower quarterly property tax payment and subsequently allow Mrs. J uh, to keep up with her living expenses and to afford a modified mortgage payment. Um, the Council's proposal to increase the income threshold for she is particularly valuable for senior citizen homeowners with reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages allow senior citizen homeowners to continue living in their homes without a mortgage payment by allowing them to draw on their equity each month. However, most reverse mortgage contracts require the homeowner to remain current on their property taxes. Failure to keep up with the property taxes is considered an automatic default on the reverse mortgage and often forms the basis for a reverse mortgage foreclosure lawsuit. As a result, rapidly increasing property taxes put senior citizens with reverse mortgages at a heightened risk of foreclosure. The risk is particularly accentuated because most seniors rely on fixed income, and those sources of income do not account for, exponentially, uh, for exponential property tax increases, even with periodic cost of living adjustments. Again, Mobilization for Justice commends the Council for recognizing the importance um, of protecting senior and disabled homeowners with expanded property tax exemptions um, and ensuring that they can remain in their homes and in their communities. Um, thank you again for holding today's hearing um, and for considering this important issue. Thank you very much. So we're going to follow up on the reverse mortgage point that you brought up. It's, you know, we actually we didn't know that that was the reality. So um, both councils will be following up with you to see if we can get more information, and we want to see what um, a legislative remedy might possibly be. Great. Um, and also, it, can you just give me, do you have an example of what your client would potentially be now saving? because of this piece of legislation? Um, she she would qualify for a 45% exemption. I'm not exactly, I don't um, know offhand what 45% her, of her current? Of her current obligations. Obligation. I'm not sure how much. And now, the percentage for veterans, is that after the veterans tax? Or how, did, how does DOF qual um, calculate all these, you know, potential savings. So is it, you know, you get one exemption and then you get the other one based on what you have left or is it on the entire bill? I'm not 100% sure, but there is a decent sized segment of veterans that don't qualify for veterans tax exemptions at all. That and would so qualify for this. They, they could qualify for these. Okay. Okay. Um, if you can um, follow up with us sure. on some data. 
just because it would help um, us as we, you know, process future exemptions and also the population. So, you know, you would think, but sometimes data is the hardest thing for us to get or, um, you know, <laughs> accurate data or even some anecdotal um, um, situations like you provide re are really helpful for us as we legislate in the, you know, moving forward. Um, all right. Well, great. Thank you so very much for coming to testify. Um, it was a very uh, educational for us, actually. Um, and I want to just thank my committee. My committee. I know that they've been working really hard, the entire finance division, um, and my councils for today's hearing. With no further questions or members, I will now adjourn this hearing. Thank you. I'm still in the morning. I just want to say.